All right, hey everybody, uh, we're gonna get started. Um, so first things first, I'll just give you a little bit of background on who I am and why we're doing these sessions. Uh, my name's Delaney, I'm an engineer at Quantopian um, and I'm in charge of our new academic outreach program and that has a bunch of different uh, facets to it. Um, we're working with uh, a lot of schools who are using us to teach and we're also trying to develop a full quantitative finance curriculum taught through um, IPython notebooks and Python algorithms on our platform and then offer that for free uh, so that in addition to anybody being able to do strategy development on our platform, anybody can come and learn quantitative finance and get the basics of what you might want to do for strategy development. Because in us being a crowdsourced hedge fund, it is in our interest to have a very well-educated user base. And so the goal of this, uh, this lecture and the series of lectures is just to try to um, give our users access to uh, some good curriculum to learn how to do strategy development. So uh, the next thing I want to say is how you can get access to the materials that I'm going to present today. Um, they currently have a temporary home, which is on the forums. Uh, I'm going to uh, make a more permanent home for them in the future, and I will release information about how to get at them when I have more information. But in the meantime, uh, the best way to get it all this, uh, all these notebooks and algorithms is to search Quantopian lecture in the forums, and I've tagged all of uh, the lectures that we've done um, with this Quantopian lecture title. So you can see the ones that I'm going to be working on today are these two: linear regression and the art of not following the market. So if you guys want to go ahead and clone these notebooks right away on your own time. Uh, you guys can follow along uh, in the notebooks uh, or just, you know, make modifications, uh, clone and tweak. One of the big things that we believe here is that innovation is a clone and tweak process. So we think that the next uh, best um, algorithms and strategies are going to come from cloning something that's already really good and tweaking it to be a few percentage points better. And so we're kind of trying to push for that by giving you access to things that you can clone and then tweak to make better. So without further ado, uh, I'll go ahead and, and, and start the actual lecture. The first part's going to be uh, a short primer on linear regression. And then going from linear regression, we're going to talk about uh, how linear regression is useful to um, compute beta and uh, then why is beta important. How can it help you? So we're going to be using uh, these notebooks to uh, present all our materials. And these notebooks are really useful because uh, they're these nice little prepackaged uh, things, which include both documentation and code. So you don't have to send code to somebody and then send documentation. They're really good for teaching in that sense because you can have um, an explanation of what's going on and kind of the textbook chapter right alongside uh, examples of how to actually do things. So what is linear regression? Um, linear regression is used a lot in more or less every academic discipline uh, because it's a really simple and robust method that can tell you a lot of things very quickly. Um, that doesn't mean that it's a perfect method and there are a lot of ways in which it can fail. Um, and one of the big things to be aware of when using linear regression is that anytime you have a method that's so simple, uh, you can miss out on a lot of complicated effects. Um, so it's just something to remember is that a lot of people kind of use linear regression, um, kind of a no questions asked basis, and you should always be asking questions. So at a, at a most basic sense, let's say you have uh, a variable x and a variable y. Um, y is usually thought of the, as thought of as the outcome variable. It's something that you're trying to predict. So let's relate this to finance. Y could be the price of an asset that you're holding, and X could be something that you think can help predict the price of the asset that you're holding. So as an example, let's say that you're holding Apple, and you want to be able to predict the price of Apple based on um, how many uh, blog posts are coming out uh, in favor of the new Apple product. Uh, and so you're going to want to say, well, 
what's the actual relationship between blog posts uh, hyping Apple products and the price of Apple? Um, so what linear regression does is it gives us a best guess for the following linear model. The linear model being y equals alpha plus beta times x. This is called a linear model because there is no complicated term in this. It's only a linear computation. Um, and this, this relationship can actually be drawn as a line on a graph. Um, so uh, the example we're actually going to use is going to be um, Tesla and the market returns, SPY. Um, and what we're going to try to figure out is how uh, Tesla, the movements in the price of Tesla, can be explained um, by movements in the price of SPY. So to do that, we're going to need to actually uh, write a function that does linear regression. So the first thing we'll do is we'll import some libraries. And uh, then we have this function here, which uh, does linear regression. So I'll walk through this briefly. I'm not going to pay too, too much attention to the exact code. Um, if you guys are curious about the exact code, I would invite you to clone the notebook, check it out, and then um, contact us with any questions you might have about the, uh, the code. Um, and you can do that uh, either by uh, emailing me or um, going through the normal support lines uh, at Quantopian. Um, and my email, just in case people don't know, is, is Delaney at Quantopian. It's D-E-L-A-N-E-Y at Quantopian. Um, so the first thing we're going to do uh, is this is a little bit of a Python quirk in how Python does linear regression. But so we're going to add this constant. And what this constant is, is we're just adding a column of ones to our data uh, x. And the reason that we do this is because linear regression in Python by default is just going to give us a best guess for this beta parameter. It's not going to give us a best guess for this alpha. So we need to explicitly tell it to give us a best guess for this alpha as well. And the way that we do that is we add a column of ones. So what we're effectively saying is y equals alpha times 1 plus beta times x. And so obviously, because that column of ones is completely independent of x, it doesn't change, uh, the best guess for alpha is going to be the same as if we had this alpha times 1 equals alpha plus beta times x. I don't know if that made sense to people, but I don't want to go too deep into it because it's not actually super important to the concept. It's just a little bit of a Python quirk. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we are actually going to tell it, get a regression and a linear model. And then ordinary least squares, which is kind of the most common form of linear regression. And I'll explain what that means in a little bit. Um, and then we're going to fit that. So we're going to fit, fit this model. And then now we have the alpha parameter and the beta parameter out of this model. And then just to be clean, we're just going to get rid of that column of ones um, that we added to our x. Then uh, what we can do, this is all summary. So um, this is to plot it. Uh, we're just going to plot uh, the x and y points on a graph so we can see how that looks. So the next step is to actually get the data that we're curious about. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get our asset prices, and that's going to be Tesla. And we're going to get this over the year of 2014. And then the second thing we're going to get is the benchmark prices for the market, the SPY ETF. And that's also going to be the over the year of 2014. And then we're going to take the percent change, which is the daily returns, because we're getting it at a daily frequency by default. Uh, we haven't said minute. And then the same thing for the benchmark. So now we have the daily returns for both the Tesla and the S&P 500. And oftentimes in finance and econometrics, um, you almost always want to consider the daily returns as your time series. Uh, and the reason for this is that you just tend to get a lot more interesting math out of your daily returns rather than considering the prices. And you'll see why here, for instance, that makes more sense to use daily returns. Um, so we're going to do our LINREG. And you can see the first thing that it prints out uh, is this summary table of all the linear regression statistics. So this is telling us a bunch of interesting stuff. And a lot of this is not going to be very useful or maybe even um, sensible to a lot of you. Uh, I'm going to tell you one thing that you really should look at, which is called the F statistic. And for those of you who are familiar with a p-value, this is effectively the p-value for the linear regression. So what does that mean? Um, the p-value is the probability uh, that uh, the test you just did 
was predictive in any way. So you have a hypothesis that something you're doing is predictive, uh, you do a test to check whether it's actually predictive, and then you get a p-value, and the p-value is the probability that it's not predictive. And what you want is for the p-value to be very low. Um, so that's what you generally hear about the 0 0.05 p-value cutoff. Uh, you want, any time you do anything, uh, testing to see if you can predict something, you want to do some kind of test to actually validate that you can predict what you're trying to predict and that test is gonna give you a p-value. In this case, uh, with linear regression, you're actually getting this f-statistic, and this f-statistic uh, is can be interpreted in the same way as a p-value. The lower it is, the higher probability that um, this linear regression model is actually predictive of uh, whatever you're trying to predict, which in this case, it is the uh, daily return of Tesla as predicted by the daily return of the market. So. You can see here, this F statistic is 10 to the negative 14th, which is great. That is definitely less than 0 0.05. And that means that we can actually go on ahead and use any of this stuff that we learned from this linear regression. It's very important that if your F statistic, or in other cases, your p-value, is above 0 0.05, you stop what you're doing and you just pretend you never did the test. And not in that you pretend you never did the test, you just don't look at the outcome. Right? Because it, the, the, the data that you're getting is actually completely useless and you can only like introduce more bias into your experiments by looking at that data. So for instance, if this p-value were 0 0.06 or 0 0.051, I would say, no, sorry, it's over 0 0.05. Um, and so I'm not even going to consider uh, this data that I just got out of this test um, or sorry, this linear regression. Uh, similarly, a lot of people think that if a p-value is, say, 0.8, it's actually like less, less significant than 0.7. That's not actually the right way to think about it. Um, the right way to think about it is it is significant if it's less than 0.05, and it is not significant if it is greater than 0.05. And you introduce a ton of statistical bias into your analysis if you, if you think about it in any other way. But moving on from that, uh, so here are the, here are the uh, coefficients that we estimated. So you can see it's estimating that constant, that alpha. Remember, alpha is a constant because it is not dependent on uh, any other variable. And then beta is the non-constant, um, the x1 coefficient. Uh, in this case, uh, the alpha has been estimated to be 0.0011, and the beta has been estimated to be 0.192 or 193. Um, so what does that mean? Well, it means that on average, on expectation, uh, if the S&P returns some amount on a day, you can expect Tesla to return about double that amount on the same day. But conversely, as you can see from this graph, what you have here is uh, the value of X versus the value of Y, and then every single day that we have returns for, we put a point down. So what this is saying is this is the uh, daily return of the S&P 500, and this is the daily return of Tesla. And you can see that the scale on this graph is way bigger. This is ranges from losing 15% to gaining 20%, whereas the S&P 500, you can see barely any points are more than a 2% loss or a 2% gain. So S the Tesla is a way more volatile asset to be holding. Um, but what you can see from here is that let's say that the S&P 500 made 2% on a day, you can see Tesla made about 4% on that day. Uh, and that line kind of tells you what the best guess is for how much Tesla will make um, given how much the S&P 500 made. And uh, like I was saying, conversely, if the S&P 500 loses 2%, Tesla is expected to lose about 4%. So this isn't saying that Tesla is gonna make you more money. This is just saying that Tesla is more volatile and it's gonna go up and down like a roller coaster, whereas the S&P 500 might be a little more stable uh, in its path. So um, generally in finance, you do want to reduce volatility because the problem with volatility is something that's volatile could kind of behave in a lot of different ways in the future. And you want to be able to predict the future so that you can consistently make money. Uh, and volatility is a bit of your enemy in this case. So um, 
you in this case you might say we're not sure if we want to hold tesla specifically but the important thing to get out of this analysis is that tesla's beta to the market is 1.93 okay uh and the other important thing to get out of this analysis is that the Tesla's beta to the market of 1.93 is over the year of 2014. If we chose a different time period, we would get a different beta. And I'll go into that a little bit later. Uh, so I'll explain more what that means in a bit when I go into my next notebook. But uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about linear regression because it's a super useful technique. Um, so linear regression versus correlation. Uh, the last lecture we did yesterday, which we'll do a webinar for in a bit, uh, I'm not sure the exact date, but I think probably in a week or two, uh, is on correlations. So if you're more curious about correlation and covariance and correlation analysis, definitely try to tune in for that one. Um, but uh, linear regression versus correlation, uh, they're very linked concepts, and they're both trying to tell you um, how one variable changes as a function of the other variable. Um, so linear regression tends to be fairly limited to uh, linear models. Correlation is also limited to linear models, but uh, it tends to be a little more general because it's it's focusing on actual uh, covariance, how much one series varies as a function of another, rather than fitting an explicit model necessarily. Um, both are actually measures of covariance. Uh, and linear regression is a little bit uh, more useful in some cases because let's say that you have many x's and you want to use many x's to predict your y, linear regression does that very easily. But correlation, it's a little trickier to say, OK, what's the correlation between uh, y and 5x's? On the other hand, linear regression can be generalized very quickly by just saying, rather than trying to fit the linear model of y equals alpha plus beta times x, you say y equals alpha plus beta 1 times x1 plus beta 2 times x2, and it will give you best guesses for all of those betas. Uh, and so this becomes very useful, as you'll see in a bit, uh, in finance because of these things known as factor models. Um, here's another big point, which I was making a little bit before. You don't actually know your parameters. You do a linear regression, you don't know the beta and you don't know the alpha that's actually true. You just know what the best guess was that linear regression gave you. Uh, and this is very important to note because a lot of times people will do a linear regression and then they'll say, oh, hmm, I do know the beta for this stock. You know, I know what the beta is for Tesla. You don't. You know the beta as the best guess estimate is over a specific time period. And that beta could change a ton um, given a different time period. So uh, what's very important and what we're going to do in one of our future lectures, uh, I think it's actually coming up soon, is... Um, showing how you need to establish a standard error, effectively a confidence interval around these parameter estimates, so that uh, you know uh, when you get a beta estimate how accurate that estimate is, whether or not you can expect that beta to hold tomorrow, or that beta estimate is specific to just today. So the next point I wanted to make is uh, ordinary least squares. I mentioned that ordinary least squares was the kind of most common form of linear regression. What does that mean? Well, ordinary least squares just means that the way that you fit this line to this cloud of points is by using this method of ordinary least squares. And what that means is you say you take the dis distance from each point to the line, and you square that, and then you sum up all of those squares, and that's how bad your fit is. And then the, the, the math works out in such a way that it's very easy to get these parameter guesses to minimize the least squares distance between your line and all the points, which gives you this nice line that fits well into this cloud of points. So if you drew another line, like maybe in this direction, um, you do your least squares and you'd see that your distance were way worse in that case than um, this line, which is the optimal, optimal line and gives you your best guess. And so for people who are familiar with thinking about things as numerical optimization, uh, this is the objective function for linear regression, and you're trying to optimize over alpha and beta to get to um, the lowest value. You're trying to minimize this objective function. Moving on from that. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, do an example case of regressing on two purely random variables just to show you what happens if you, know, you get uh, data that's not actually meaningful. Um, so we'll do that. 
you can see it printed out a lot of useful looking information, but what's the first thing we do? We go look at the p-value, the F statistic. It is above 0 0.05, so we just pretend like we, just, we don't even look at the rest of it. This is not useful. This is, this is nonsense, and it's not telling you anything about the data, which is good because this is randomly generated, so we would hope that it would say there's no meaningful relationship in this data. Uh, you can see here it's a little dangerous because if you did this analysis yourself, you might look at the visual line and you'd be like, hmm, that's actually a bit of a slope. Maybe there is a relationship here. No, there isn't, and you do need to go ahead and check the F statistic before you do any kind of interpretation of what's going on in this graph. So uh, then the last thing here is uh, making uh, uh, a case where it actually is related. So in this case, Y is X plus a little bit of random noise. Uh, and so you, again, you can see here, let's check the p-value, the f statistic, and that is very low, below 0 0.05, so we're fine. We can look at everything else. And sure enough, um, we made y equals linearly dependent, uh, directly dependent on 1 times x, and we get our x1 coefficient to be very close to 1, so that's good. And you can see that's what the relationship looks like. So this is a very nice, clean, um, predictive linear regression model. Uh, and you can see that these points are pretty tightly clustered around this uh, line of best fit. So that's what you kind of expect to see in a case where your linear regression model were very predictive. Um, but again, the, the main thing to trust is this F statistic and uh, look at that before you do anything else. Um, so this was kind of a, a, a quick basics overview of linear regression and we're gonna go into some of the more interesting stuff with beta hedging, which is very important. Um, but for any of you more curious about maybe, you know, like the mathematical background or how this relates to numerical optimization or other objective functions you can use. Uh, Wikipedia has a really great resource on this and I encourage you to check it out. Um, but for the meantime, uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, go to um, the other notebook, which is on uh, not following the market or beta hedging. So, what is beta hedging? Well, the first thing that I'm gonna explain here is factor models. Uh, well, what are factor models? Factor models are things that look like this. So this should look kind of familiar because we were just dealing with linear regression. What is this? Well, this is just a linear model, right? You're saying y depends on a constant plus beta one times x1 plus beta two times x2, and you can have as many of these x's as you want. So how is this useful in finance? Well, the most common use case is you say the returns of something, an asset, is equal to a constant plus beta one times x1, and x1, let's say, is uh, the price of oil uh, in Saudi Arabia. So the, the, the price of your asset is equal to beta one times the price of oil in Saudi Arabia plus beta two times market returns plus, and then you can have as many of them as you want. You can put your, uh, you can put your cat's weight and height in there if you want to. Um, and just see if anything's predictive. Uh, so the reason that this is done is uh, um, people want to be able to determine uh, the beta of one asset to a factor. So these are called factors. And these factors can be other assets. They don't have to be um, you know, meaningful measures. And so uh, every asset has a beta to every other asset. Uh, and, and, you know, it's up to you to figure out what factors you want to put in your model to make it actually predictive. Um, but how is this useful? So uh, when people say the beta of a stock, what they mean most of the time is uh, if they do a model where your asset returns equals alpha plus beta times the market returns, X in this case, then that's your beta, okay? So when you hear of your strategy as saying, you know, you have a beta of 0.9, what that means is if you took the returns of your strategy and the returns of the benchmark, in this case, the market, um, the S&P 500, and you said, give me the best guess for the parameters alpha and beta, then beta would come out as 0.9, as the best guess. Now, intuitively, what that means is 0.9, um, 90% of your returns can be explained by market movements. 
So that means your returns are very dependent on market movements. Okay, and we'll go into that a little bit uh, after this example that we have here. Um, and I'm gonna explain how that relates to risk exposure um, and, and hedging and everything. And you can see here, again, like I said, you can generalize this as much as you want. So you can have Tesla and have it be a beta to uh, the market and a beta to Apple and just compute both of those. So uh, what we'll do here uh, is we will get data for Tesla and Apple, uh, sorry, Tesla and SPY, um, again, over the same period of 2014. This should be familiar, we just saw it. But now instead of plotting it as a scatter plot, I just wanna show you guys, here's what it looks like as a time series. So remember, we already computed the beta of Tesla to the SPY over that time period was 1.93. So what does that mean? It means that when Tesla, when the market goes up, Tesla goes way up. When the market goes down, Tesla goes way down. And that's the behavior you see here. You see this massive, massive volatility in Tesla in daily returns, um, whereas the market uh, is kind of moving at a much, much smaller rate in there. This is pretty useful to know because you know you want to know what you're holding and what it's doing. Uh, and this is just the visual explanation of what it looks like to have Tesla, a much more volatile security than the market. <clears throat> Sorry. So again, let's go ahead and perform that regression. And uh, this is just our regression function. This is simpler now because we're not as concerned with uh, the regression part. We just want to get out this alpha and beta parameter. Uh, so uh, this is our alpha and beta parameter. And you can see, sure enough, it gets us the same value. So math is still working. And um, the next thing we're gonna do is again, just as a refresher, we'll show you that line of best fit. Uh, I'm just doing this because I want these notebooks to stand on their own so that people don't look at this and then be like, um, you know, or they need the linear regression notebook to understand it. So this is just the same plot that we were looking at before. So I said I'd tell you what this meant in, in terms of risk exposure. And this is really, really important. This is super key to pretty much all of quantitative finance. Um, and there's like a tremendous number of people who work their entire lives just focusing on risk exposure. Um, so when you're developing strategies, it's incredibly important to, uh, to uh, you know, understand what risk exposure is and, and, and why it's important. Um, and uh, I just did, I did get a question here, so I will, I will take a break um, at the end of this notebook and I will, I will answer any questions that you might have. So uh, feel free to ask them at any time. And then um, when I do take a break, I'll go ahead and, and answer questions. Um, so uh, the reason that it's really important to think about things in uh, terms of risk exposure uh, is, uh, that beta that we just saw uh, is, a, is effectively your risk exposure to that factor, okay? So what does that mean? Well, again, let's say that we have um, Tesla and we have the market. So Tesla's risk exposure to the market is 1.93, okay? That means that um, what basically Tesla is going to, uh, have an incredibly high exposure to the market. It's actually more than one, right? So whatever the market does, Tesla will do even more violently than the market. Uh, so for, um, for things like the market, this is actually really bad for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is you generally want to make your strategy as agnostic to other factors as possible, right? You want the strategy that it's an ATM, it prints returns every day, regardless of what happens in the world, right? And so what you could do is imagine making this giant factor model um, with like everything listed as a factor. You have the price of every other asset, you have the market, you have oil futures, you have instability of government ratios as determined by the UN or NGOs, and then you run this linear regression and you find that your beta to pretty much every factor is zero. That's incredible. That means that your algorithm will keep making money even if like Turkey has a revolution, right? This is like huge world changing events and your algorithm just chugs along and gets reasonable returns. So uh, this is what you want and this is what we mean by pure alpha because if in this factor model, all of your betas are zero, 
all of your returns are encapsulated in this alpha, and alpha is a constant. It doesn't change. So every day, you're just going to get that alpha, and it doesn't matter what any of these other factors do. On the other hand, if your beta is very high, like Tesla, and has a very low alpha, uh, your returns are incredibly dependent on what the market does. And, um, you know, th that's just generally not great. Another reason that this is not great is because uh, it's very easy for investors to get market exposure, right? So if you say, my strategy has good returns, but high market exposure, investors are not interested in that because if they wanted market exposure, they would go buy a leveraged market ETF, right? That's very, it's very easy for them to make a high beta bet on the market. It's very cheap and they can do it at any time. So that's not what they're interested in. They're interested in buying things that they can't get cheaply in other places. And those things are algorithms that are pure alpha. Um, and that pure alpha uh, is really what makes algorithms attractive to investors. And so when we're designing our hedge fund um, and setting up our managers program, the algorithms that we're interested in are algorithms that are mostly pure alpha uh, when you do these factor models to whatever factors you throw at them. So, um, well, how do you get to that point? So uh, you have risk exposure, and then the response to risk exposure is what's known as risk management. Um, and again, there are many, many people who, uh, you know, go ahead and work their entire lives in risk management. So um, one of the best ways to manage risk uh, well, there's, there's kind of two main ways. One is diversification and one is hedging. Um, and I, it, I'm, this, this is one of those like kind of simplifications of the space that I'm sure I will get in some, in some trouble with some people with. Um, but uh, for now, we're just going to focus on hedging um, because that's one of the best ways um, to get your algorithm's beta lower. So what does hedging mean? Well, hedging is saying the following. Hedging is saying... Uh, your portfolio or strategy or whatever it is, uh, is equal to alpha plus beta times uh, the market, okay? So that we're, in this case, we're just going to be hedging against the market. Again, you can hedge against anything you want um, as long as it's shortable. Uh, but so what you say is we want to cancel out any of our risk exposure to the market, SPY. So what we do is we take that beta and then we take the dollar volume of our portfolio and we take out a negative beta times dollar volume short on SPY. And then our new return formula is equal to this. Our portfolio returns is equal to alpha plus beta times SPY minus beta times SPY because we just took out that short. So all that's left over is alpha, okay? So that's what we wanted, right? And you can imagine if we had more factors in that model, you could just take out more shorts to reduce the risk exposure to those other factors. You could take out a short on Apple, you could take out a short on whatever other asset you wanted to reduce your risk exposure to that asset. So that if Apple releases a dud for this iPhone success, you know, and its stock tanks, you're not gonna suffer any of that risk because you're not exposed. So when you have a strategy um, that has a beta of zero, that's what's known as market neutral. And that's what we want, right? We want strategies that are market neutral pure alpha, um, the beta to the market is zero. And that's why in the contest, we have that beta requirement that to be eligible, your algorithm has to have a beta between negative 0.3 and positive 0.3. Now, of course, there's problems with estimation here because it's a moving target, right? So when we do this linear regression on some historical time period, we know what our returns were and we know what the market returns were, and we can get this best guess for beta, but again, we don't know beta, and we don't know what it's gonna to be tomorrow. So when we take out this dollar volume short, um, we can't actually perfectly cancel out uh, this risk. We're always gonna have some leftover risk unless our estimate for beta is perfect. So in practice, beta hedging isn't actually, you know, it can't actually completely reduce your exposure, it just partially reduces your exposure. You can definitely reduce it, but it's never going to get it down to zero because um, beta is a quantity that's always changing. Um, it's a real world quantity, you know, it moves around and uh, it's just impossible to predict it exactly. Um, but it definitely helps. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying don't be surprised when you can't just use beta hedging to get your algorithm down to zero. 
Um, you can also put in place some structural changes, which I'll show uh, towards the end of this webinar um, that help a lot. And that's namely long short equity. For those of you who know what that means, you'll kind of know what's coming. So how to actually implement hedging. So I'll actually just show you an example of that. Um, so what you can see here is uh, what we've done is we've just made our portfolio returns to be, um, remember we got the returns for the benchmark and our asset earlier, in this case, the market and Tesla. And we're gonna go ahead and we're going to um, take out that hedge on the market as our portfolio. And what you can see here is um, basically this is showing you what holding Tesla uh, plus the hedge is gonna do, right? Because remember that in Tesla, in the returns of Tesla, there's a bunch of market returns. So you can think of Tesla as being alpha plus uh, beta times R underscore B. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to cancel out that beta component, uh, market component of Tesla. And so what you can see here is um, this uh, actually, uh, what you can see is that you can see here's Tesla and the pink line. And you can see that this blue line of holding Tesla plus the hedge actually uh, tends to be a little less volatile than Tesla. But the question is still, uh, did it reduce your beta to the market, right? You're, you can't really tell that by looking at this graph. And this is just another example of why uh, looking at graphs is not really a reliable way to do analysis. You really do have to trust the numbers. Uh, because if I t show you this graph and I'm like, hmm, do you think this reduced your beta to the market? Like, if you think you can tell me that, like, either you're some kind of, you know, uh, genius or, like, you're lying. So um, the first thing we can do is let's just look at what it did to the mean returns and the uh, volatility of the returns. Uh, right off the bat. So you can see uh, the mean returns of the portfolio versus the asset. Uh, the asset, Tesla, is actually getting double the mean returns. And I'll explain why that's true in a second. Um, uh, but the volatility of, uh, can we say that the volatility of the portfolio is lower? Uh, unfortunately, we can't because we didn't compute a standard error, a confidence interval around the volatility that we computed. So like we get 0.027 and 0.03 are those actually different? Are those actually statistically significantly different? I, I have no idea. I'd have to compute a confidence interval around both of them to know. Um, so that's just a, another common mistake that's made is like, oh, this is lower. Well, it's you don't know if it's actually lower or if it's just measurement error. So um, we'll just go ahead and run that linear regression. And so let's see what we got. We got uh, of our new portfolio, which includes the hedge. We got alpha is something that's very small, and beta is zero, effectively, 10 to the negative 16th. Okay, so great, we completely reduced our beta to zero. This is perfect, we got rid of all market exposure. Tesla now has, I'm sure, exposure to a ton of other things, but at least we got our beta, as commonly referred to, the beta to the market, down to zero. So now, you know, your contest entry is good to go. Of course, like I said earlier, this is completely backwards looking, right? So this is, let's look at 2014, um, standing on January 1st of 2015. Let's look at 2014, compute the beta, and then hedge by that beta. Of course, you're gonna get down to zero because you knew the beta, you knew what happened. What happens if you actually try to hedge going forward? Well, we'll show what happens. This code uh, computes the beta over 2014 and then does the same logic to hedge over the next six months going into 2015 uh, and then just goes ahead and uh, repeats the, the math that we did before and prints out some results, which I'll show you here. So here's what it looks like, okay? So you can see there's the test, there's our portfolio, the Tesla plus hedge, and then Tesla and the market by itself. Again, not super informative to look at this graph and say what's going on, um, but what you can see is, so here's the historical estimate. It estimated that, um, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't recompute this value, so this should actually be 1.93. Uh, I apologize for that. But the important thing to note is that, so you've got your 1.93 estimate from before over 2014. Um, and then the out of sample beta over the next six months is actually only 1.04. So the beta changed to a tremendous amount, right? This is like, you're saying, I estimated the beta to be 1.93 over 24, 2014. I'm gonna walk forward with that. Well, actually you're gonna be incredibly wrong. And so as you can see, is that you hedged based on that beta estimate and 
the uh, resulting beta of your portfolio because your hedge beta was so wrong is actually still close to one. Now the thing is it did reduce it, right? Because it reduced it from the one that it would have been had you done no hedging. But it didn't reduce it a tremendous amount. Um, it's better than nothing, but it's just an example of showing you how difficult it is to hit that moving beta target, right? Um, and so we're gonna have a full lecture come out uh, I believe it's actually the next meetup uh, that we're going to do talking about, you know, moving targets and why it's so dangerous to assume that you know anything when you've computed your beta and, you know, they, you're basically saying, okay, well, this beta will be the same next year or tomorrow. It, 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 it's, it's not going to be, and you need to understand how much variance there is in your estimate so that you can, instead of saying beta will be the same tomorrow, you'll say beta will be in this range tomorrow, and then you're okay. And as long as your math still works out of betas in that range, then you're fine. Um, so uh, a, a big point that I wanted to make here is, uh, so a lot of people don't, well, I don't know a lot of people, but I've heard this a lot. That's, oh, wait, but why would I hedge? Because it reduces my returns. And yes, it does reduce your returns, okay? But only in an up market. And you can leverage after you've reduced your beta. What do I mean by that? Okay, so let's go back up to that model. Let's say you uh, have your, um, your, your, your portfolio equals alpha plus uh, beta times spy, and, or your strategy, and you say, okay, um, I've reduced this beta uh, down to zero, okay? And so you've gotten rid of all the returns uh, that come from spy. And now your strategy returns are lower, of course, because the return, the way, you know, you've gotten rid of a quantity that was positive. So Y is going to be lower. It's going to be pure alpha, right? So your returns will be lower, uh, but you're going to have no risk exposure to SPY, right? And this is really good because it means that this is now actually something that investors are interested in. The other thing that hedging tells you is how much of your strategy was uh, actually you being clever and producing alpha and how much of it was just you taking out a leveraged bet on the market, right? And so sometimes you can have a strategy that seems really clever and then you do this and you determine there's actually not much alpha in it and it's actually just a leveraged bet on the market, okay? Makes sense? So this is really saying like what's really in your strategy? That's the alpha. That's actually your strategy. Um, and the other important thing is once you remove a lot of risk exposure, that'll bring your volatility down and that will bring your sharp ratio up. And once you've reduced your volatility and reduced your risk exposure, uh, you can actually confidently leverage uh, your algorithm. So you can borrow money and run your algorithm on that money because you trust that it's not going to tank next week when the market tanks or when China defaults or whatever crazy thing happens. Um, and so what you can actually do is you can take your returns that you've produced and bring them back up to the same point that they were before, except now they'll be way more consistent. Or you can just sell it to an investor who'll want to leverage it because they trust that you've reduced your risk exposure. So um, that's a really important point, that it's okay to reduce your returns by hedging. Uh, and then um, there's other types of hedging. Pairs trading is a really common one. Pairs trading actually implicitly hedges because you always have one long and one short, and those pairs are hedged against each other. Um, and then long short equity is actually kind of the uh, generalization of pairs trading, where instead of keeping one pair or a set of 20 or 30 pairs, you rank all stocks on some ranking system that you've developed. Maybe it's some fundamental metric. And then you take the top P percent and the bottom P percent and you long the top P percent and you bought, short the bottom P percent so that you're always long and short equally in, in dollar volume. And in this case, uh, because you've longed a ton and shorted a ton, um, your beta will actually be pretty darn close to zero because if the market goes up, you make money on the stuff you've longed and you lose money on the stuff you've shorted and you kind of break even. And the case in which you make money is if your ranking system actually can determine that the stuff near the top is going to do better than the stuff near the bottom. So you, do, you make money on the spread. You make money on how well your ranking system differentiates stocks. And this is kind of a really nice industry standard um, way to do trading. And it's what uh, at Quantopian we think 
is really going to produce some of the best algorithms for the managers program. So these are the type of algorithms that if you want to be part of the managers program at Quantopian, you should probably um, be, tr be learning and, and trying to developing, you know, and they're also fairly simple to implement because you just need to figure out a ranking system for stocks. And then the rest of it, as you'll see, like we've, we've given you the code to do the rest of it here. Um, so that's the end of the uh, stats portion of the lecture. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go over some algorithms that we made to actually implement uh, beta hedging and long short equity. And they're also all available um, in the forums. Uh, oops, I, they're all available somewhere in here. Uh, yeah, so uh, if we go to the um, uh, not following the market lecture, you'll see in addition to cloning the notebook, you can clone all of these algorithms. Um, which I can't clone because they're mine, but you'll be able to clone them. And you can actually take this home, see how beta hedging is implemented, uh, and see how uh, long short head uh, is implemented. And we've made these so that you can swap out your own ranking systems in the long short, and that you can copy paste the beta hedging logic into your own algorithms. If you have, say, a good algorithm that is just a little too high beta for your liking, and you want to go ahead and try um, hedging it and seeing how low you can get your beta. So uh, before I go ahead and do the algorithms, um, I'm going to answer some questions that people had uh, as, as best I can. I, I, I can't promise perfect answers here, but and then people who uh, have the time to stay around for 10 to 15 minutes of algorithms um, uh, can do so. So the first question I have is from uh, Simon, and he's asking, um, could you go over the pros, of con pros and cons of including an alpha parameter in the models of all, um, i.e. the meaning of estimating a linear drift versus bias in the beta parameters? Sure, so uh, the reason, uh, if it's not clear yet, that it makes sense to include an alpha parameter is because um, you have what's kind of commonly referred to as uh, abnormal returns, and that's basically summarized in your alpha parameter. So the more factors in your model, the lower alpha will be, but the, also the more certain you will be of whatever remaining alpha is left over. So you can imagine that you know you have a lot of alpha without any betas. It's all like alpha is all of your returns, and then you put in a factor to the market, and your alpha is going to be lower because some of it's coming from the market, but you're more confident in that alpha to be consistent and then you put in a factor to oil prices, and you put in a factor to small cap stocks, and then you put in the fam of French factors, and whatever alpha is left over after putting in um, kind of the 10 to 20 common factors in what would be uh, like an industry standard risk management model, uh, and they usually have like, they have like sets of factors that they know and they use. Um, and once you put in those 10 to 20 factors, anything that's in your alpha that's left over is kind of like ironclad returns. And that's really what you're looking for, is you're looking for um, ways to measure whatever is left over once, uh, you're, once, you've, once you've gotten rid of all your risk exposure. Um, so I'm not sure if that's exactly answering your question, but like, please ask a follow-up if I, if I didn't go over something. Uh, so the next question is from Jason, and uh, he says, in the example where you showed Tesla's beta in regards to Apple and SPY, um, it would be the same beta SPY as when you only calculate the linear regression of Tesla SAS SPY. Um, let me see. This will be this. I'm trying to understand exactly what he's asking here. Um, so beta the SPY be the same in both cases. Or will including Apple in regression change the beta for SPY? Uh, oh, okay, okay, sure, yeah. So the question is, will including Apple, will adding another factor change your beta um, to one of the first factors? And uh, the, okay, I'm actually not 100% sure. I, I think the answer is no. Um, I, because the way to think about it is that Let's say you compute your beta to spy uh, in the uh, y equals alpha plus beta times x model, and then you add another factor. That factor is going to be coming out of alpha, right? You're going to remove some of stuff that's left over in alpha, and that's not going to change your exposure 
to spy. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that the way it's going to work, and like I, I one of the, what I would recommend is just taking that notebook and cloning it, and then changing uh, changing it a little bit so that you uh, instead of x being one dimensional, x is two dimensional. You add another factor to it, uh, and uh, just making sure that this makes sense. But the way that I see it is. Um, that uh, you know your exposure to the market is your exposure to the market, and then the exposure to other factors is encapsulated in that alpha. And then every time you add a factor, you're taking a little bit out of alpha and and moving it to that factor. Uh, so the next question um, is from uh, Marie Nelly, and she says, just to reconfirm your return calculate and your out of sample. Uh, are with a fixed beta from in sample. Yes, that's right. So the returns that we calculated were with a portfolio hedged from a fixed beta that we calculated one time uh, from the uh, in sample data. We didn't walk forward and recompute it, um, which is definitely a better way to do it. My recommendation is actually to use Kalman filters to uh, constantly estimate your beta. Um, and we're going to do uh, definitely at some point, I'm not sure exactly when, but one of our notebooks that we release in one of the lectures we do will be on Kalman filters because they're pretty ubiquitous and they're kind of really necessary to um, estimate moving quantities uh, like uh, beta or sharp ratio. Um, so the next question is from Walter and he says, how will alpha change over time? Um, it's independent of the market factor, but it's not a constant. Yes, exactly. So that's exactly right. So both of these parameters that you've estimated, your best guesses, will change over time, right? So you're, if you measure your alpha and beta today, they'll be one thing. And if you measure your alpha and beta tomorrow, they'll be another thing. Um, and the hope is that they're both pretty consistent, right? Because if you say that your algorithm has an alpha of 0.2, um, which would be uh, if everything else is left over, that's 20% annualized returns. If you say that your alf algor algorithm has an alpha of 0.2, um, then uh, that's today, and then you measure it tomorrow, and the alpha is 0.15, and then you measure it the next day, and it's 0.25. That's, I, I mean, like obviously, like you need more sample points to determine the actual volatility, but that's pretty volatile. And then what you do is you establish a confidence interval around that using the volatility of the estimate. Uh, again, we'll we'll discuss this in a future lecture, um, and you'd see that that's actually pretty wide. And so what you'd say is, hmm, well, my estimate for alpha is moving around a ton, so I'm not really that confident that tomorrow when I go to actually, you know, run the algorithm, my alpha is going to be anywhere near what I've estimated. So again, it's just important to, whenever you estimate these quantities, really know how... Um, how much they're moving so that you can know what it's going to look like tomorrow. Okay, so again, uh, ask questions as they come up. I'll take breaks to uh, answer them, but the last thing I wanted to show was um, these algorithms uh, that, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll go over them pretty quickly um, just so that, because we, we are kind of running out of time, um, but uh, I'll go ahead and see if I can answer any questions like uh, past time that, that people might have. Um, so the first thing uh, that uh, we have here is this is just an algorithm that does a long only portfolio, um, but with no beta hedging. And this is over the uh, financial collapse of 2008, 2009. Okay. So you can see, um, basically you can see it's pretty, correlated to the market. That's the long only going ahead. You can see here, it looks like it even has a higher exposure to the market than the market itself, a beta of more than one. Uh, it doesn't do too hot. Here's the same algorithm with uh, beta hedging turned on. It, you can see it recovers faster. And this is really the cases in which beta hedging pays off, right? Beta hedging is going to pay off in the cases when the market goes south and uh, you, know, you, you don't want to be holding long only. And you can see here, the beta is still high. It's 0.84 but it was reduced by from 0.12. So there's definitely a reduction in there. Again, it's not perfect. You can't get it down to zero, but it's better than nothing. Um, the next thing is there's another, we shared uh, two algorithms and in both you can turn beta hedging on and off. And again, that's on the uh, forum thread here and you can clone any of them. 
This is the one that I think is really good that you guys should check out. This is long. This is a long short equity. This is using a fundamental ranking scheme to rank stocks. And uh, you can see here, without doing any hedging, the beta is already zero, right? Uh, so what? The, and it's for the reasons I said before. You know that the your when you're when you're long short in equal dollar volume, it doesn't matter what the market does. You're going to make money based on your spread. Okay. So you can see here. This this is, does okay during the financial crisis. You know, it does not it does not uh, succumb like the other algorithm did. Uh, and this is your alpha. This is your remaining returns once you've taken the market out of the equation. Um, and you can see that this this is a this is a pretty solid algorithm. You know, this would have weathered the crisis. You would not have lost money. Um, and then here's the same algorithm with beta hedging turned on. As you can see, it pretty much does nothing because you're already perfectly beta hedged. So, uh, you know, if you turn on beta hedging for an algorithm that is already basically zero beta, you're effectively telling it to take out zero dollars in a short. So not surprisingly, uh, it doesn't really change the performance at all. Um, so uh, for the last couple minutes, um, again, please, if you're curious, go ahead and uh, clone those algorithms. Um, for the next for the next webinar, I'll definitely try to leave a little more time to go over the algorithms, but uh, hopefully you guys get the the concepts of of, of why these algorithms are useful. And uh, we're hoping that um, some of you will clone, you know, say the long short strategy, and then implement figure out some genius uh, ranking scheme that ends up being, you know, the next uh, the next super successful algorithm. Um, so I'm going to answer. One more question as best I can, uh, and then I think we have to wrap up based, just based on time. Um, so the last question is, comparing a two stock por two uh, portfolio stock, why don't don't we have to consider the covariance? Um, yes, absolutely, and that's actually uh, what we talked about in uh, last night's meetup. So uh, rather than uh, answering that question, I think that I will go for like basically a full 30 minutes talking about that uh, in the next webinar. Um, and the second question, I actually don't think I have enough time to answer. It's about uh, adjusted R squared. So what I'll do um, is I will come up with an answer to this question and I will post it on the uh, forum post um, for, the, for this particular uh, webinar, which is the art of not following the market. So um, I'll definitely get an answer to you, but uh, I think I do have to wrap up now. So Thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, we're going to have these webinars regularly over the summer, um, and they're all going to be similar topics of, you know, stats and, and quantitative finance and how to actually build algorithms that work. Um, so again, I hope you guys enjoyed this and found it informative, uh, and uh, I appreciate your time. So, thank you. <laughs>